find a good product, which usually people are like, okay, maybe we can start with something cheap. We, we sell it very fast. Okay, this is not a good idea. When you're selling something cheap, clients are usually not happy with it. The traffic to the e-com shops in our region is coming from social media and the percentage is huge. What happens if the client buys and there is a problem? So here is, in my opinion, the most important thing. You have to be able to provide exclusively good customer support. This is the, the point where you are touching directly with the client. Στο σημερινό επεισόδιο έχουμε μαζί μας τον Νίκολα Έλτσεπ, e-commerce expert που έχει ως στόχο να ερνεύσει την επόμενη γενιά επιχειρηματιών και επαγγελματιών του ηλεκτρονικού εμπορίου. Ο Νίκολα είναι ιδρυτής του Balkan e-commerce summit, μια ετήσια μεγάλη διήμερη συγκέντρωση ηλεκτρονικού εμπορίου και ψηφιακού μετασχηματισμού που προσελκύει επιχειρήσει και ηγέτε του κλάδου από περισσότερε από 15 χώρε στα Βαλκάνια και την Κεντρική Ευρώπη. Πέραν τη παροχή ευκαιριών για δικτύωση, το συνέδριο διευκολύνει τι διασυνοριακέ συνεργασίε που είναι απαραίτητε για επιχειρήσει ηλεκτρονικού εμπορίου που αναζητούν νέε αγορέ. Ο Νίκολα Έλτσε είναι επίση και ο ιδρυτή και πρέσβη των e-commerce Academy Awards. Επιπλέον, από το 2015, ο Νίκολα είναι ο ιδρυτή του e-commerce Academy PG, όπου Διαδραματίζει καθοριστικό ρόλο στη δημιουργία και οργάνωση εκπαιδευτικών προγραμμάτων ηλεκτρονικού εμπορίου. Με ρεκόρ πάνω από 4.300 συμμετοχέ σε σεμινάρια, έχει επιτύχει σημαντική διείσδυση στην αγορά του ηλεκτρονικού εμπορίου. Do you think Bulgaria is a good country to do business in? Because here in Greece, many people go there to do business and establish a business. What are the secrets to have a growth in e-commerce company and be at the top of the list? Hello and welcome back to another Business Talks podcast episode here in Business Review Greece studio. Today we have a very special guest. He comes only for two days here in Greece from Bulgaria. We have the founder of Balkan e-commerce summit and also the founder of uh, the biggest academy in Bulgaria, the e-commerce academy. And the name is Nikola Ilcev. Yeah, that's correct. That's exactly yeah. how you pronounce my name because I know that it's kind of uh, difficult for you guys to pronounce my name, but you pronounce it very well. Yeah, I know how to pronounce names uh, through football because I'm a football <laughs> fan. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, thank you that you are here. Uh, what are your uh, opinion about Athens and Greece? First of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I feel great here. You have a very nice studio. Uh, Athens is great. I, I had the chance to have a little walk last night around the center of the city. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, I like the spirit. I like the, the way that uh, the, the, all the places, uh, the coffee shops and the restaurants are welcoming people. So Athens is one great place to, to be. Uh, I hope next time I'll have more time and I will enjoy more, most, more, more activities here. Uh, what do you think that uh, there, there are the, the differences between Greece and Bulgaria and other Balkan countries? Well, there are many differences. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the first one when ex you are doing business actually uh, is uh, you have to understand the mentality of each market uh, because uh, the, the north you go, you have a different uh, way of people doing business. Uh, they're, uh, you know, In our region, everybody is oriented in having a nice long conversation. They're not uh, doing business immediately after the first uh, call. You know, this is uh, not uh, like, uh, let's say, German style or Western European style where uh, people are getting right into the conversation with the things that they have to to do uh, in terms of business here in our region. And I can see this in, in uh, um, Greece as well. Uh, we have to have a long conversation about the general stuff we have to get to know each other a little bit we have to i can say we have to become friends first before we go to the to the business topics and i like this uh, type of approach because for me business is not just uh, making some uh, money quick money and uh, run away business is uh, building uh, friendship building uh, partnership building uh, community building uh, long lasting partnership that's true right. here in greece we need to have a coffee for three hours and then we can talk about business <laughs> Uh, would you like to tell us a bit about your background and what the um, e-commerce Balkan Summit is? 
Yeah, um, I started uh, working in the field of e-commerce 13 years ago in 2011. Uh, actually, it was kind of funny because I'm coming from a different field. I I'm, I'm an engineer by education and I come from uh, the field of construction. Uh, during the crisis, uh, the financial crisis between 2009 and 2011 12, uh, I was uh, occupied in the business of construction. We had some uh, financial difficulties. Uh, and how I got to the e comm business is that uh, um, we were running a family business. We had some financial troubles, as I said. Uh, we were running out of cash, but in the same time, we had a lot of stock uh, in our warehouse. So I was looking to find a solution to sell this uh, products that we have in our warehouse uh, quickly, in a fast way. So the only way I found was through internet. During that moment, at uh, this moment, I didn't know anything about selling online, anything about e-commerce, anything about building websites, nothing. So I went to a company to order a, a shop, an on online shop. Actually, it was a platform where not only me, but also other companies uh, in my situation can sell their uh, goods uh, quick and fast. We built the, the platform. Uh, we started calling, actually, the whole business idea was to call more and more companies. We started calling companies. We started sending them the domain. You can imagine that this was in a moment when uh, we didn't have uh, any chat platforms like Viber, WhatsApp or any other, we were sending the domain of the website via SMS. And I remember doing this uh, from a Nokia with buttons. <laughs> it was a very strange period uh, looking at from the perspective of the time. Uh, so yeah, we established this platform. Um, and I can easily say that this is my first e-com fail because uh, we couldn't uh, get enough people to put products in our platform. We went uh, with this platform for six, seven months. We were we were pushing it around to, to different businesses, but we never got uh, a good amount of uh, listings for products in it. So I decided, okay, this is not our thing. Obviously, there is a reason. This was a time when the smartphones smartphones were not as we know them today. Uh, you know, internet was not the same. The digital culture of people to, to look for products and buy products online was not the same. So obviously, this project was not... Uh, meant to be in that uh, that moment. But I saw that uh, e-commerce is my thing. I made uh, my hobby a business. My hobby uh, is uh, different gadgets, smart uh, phones, tablets, and so on and so on. So this is why uh, I made a, an online business with uh, accessories for mobile devices and small consumer electronics. And from that moment on to 2018, this was my main activity. And how, if you are asking how the whole idea of uh, e-commerce academy and then Balkan e-commerce summit uh, came to my mind, actually, at some point, I got so well connected in the field of e-commerce that I wanted to gather these people from time to time uh, and, uh, you know, have discussions on how we can be better, how we can grow our businesses, expand, for example. So in 2016, uh, we registered the, the company e-commerce academy and uh, yeah we what we did is uh, was uh, one big event uh, in my home city Ruse uh, it was visited by 450 people it was nice actually it was a free event mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was nice uh, and uh, ever since we we are doing uh, events we are publishing uh, uh, literature, books. Uh, we have uh, our own YouTube channel with informational and educational videos. We have a podcast. We are running the only niche e-commerce uh, competition in Bulgaria. Uh, and yeah, Balkan e-commerce summit, which is the star of our activities. You said that uh, you make your hobby as a business. Yeah. Do you agree with the opinion that when your hobby become business, uh, then you lose your hobby? No. I think that it's uh, completely the opposite because I can tell you that uh, from the activities that we have right now, because our main occupation right now is uh, um, developing different types of events uh, e for e-commerce and digital marketing, because this is the only focus that we have, e-commerce and digital marketing. I can tell you that one of my, not exactly hobbies, but things I loved to do during my whole life was gathering people, being uh, the organizer of the group. Even when I was a kid uh, and in high school, for example, I was the one 
picking the place where the the friends will gather, uh, picking the activities that we're gonna do during uh, uh, the time we are together. So this uh, became as something that I love to do as a profession and my business, and I love it. Nice, and uh, you said uh, also that uh, the first e-commerce platform that you make uh, it was a failure. What's your um, your point of view when you have failed in one project? Why you choose to make another project in the same uh, category and the same? Two reasons. <laughs> I will I will tell you <laughs> my two reasons. First of all, I uh, perceive the failure as a learning process. In each failure, you are learning what you did wrong, so next time you can do it better. And the second, this is the first reason. And the second reason is that after my first failure, during the process of this failure, actually I realized that uh, the thing that I was doing is very nice and I want to be in that field. I wanted to be in the field of e-commerce because as I said, during the, the, the first failure, I didn't know anything about selling online, making listings. I didn't know what is a usability test. You know, uh, with the first platform, we made it. And I start calling my friends and I said, guys, can you go through the website and just start clicking around, just checking if it's working or not, just to see if we made some mistakes. I didn't know that this thing is called usability test and that this is an unusual thing that you do when you are building such a platform, you know. So in my opinion, learning from your mistakes and also, you know, finding your thing for a long run is very important. And this is when, this is how failure becomes handy. And of course, it's also the timing because uh, you said that uh, you make the platform uh, too early. Yeah. Uh, from uh, about the technology that uh, we had. Uh, yeah, for one reason or another, yeah, it was too early for such thing. Later on, I saw many different uh, platforms like this uh, for different fields. It, they were not exactly for construction, for different fields, but uh, yeah, we cannot do anything about it. Sometimes we are early, sometimes we are late. You, you, you have to be very knowledgeable. You have to, sometimes you have to have some luck to, to, to pick the right moment for something. So, but we have to live with uh, our choices, you know, some, and our mistakes. Sometimes you do a mistake, but you have to move on. I remember I had heard uh, Jeff Bezos say that the first ever purchase of Amazon was from a guy in Bulgaria. So I think that shows that Bulgaria and maybe countries that are a bit smaller on the map, like Greece, are a bit more forward in some things. Um, so how do you see the state of e-commerce in Bulgaria and Greece, generally in the Balkan states, compared to the rest of Europe? Right now, our uh, e-commerce is in a very good position. According to some researches that uh, we received from a, one of our partners, uh, which is called uh, eShop Barometer, this is the name of the research, we can see that the Balkans are super dynamic markets right now. And actually, the whole Western Europe and Central European businesses are looking at us because so far we were uh, perceived as, a, as an underdeveloped market. And now with our growth and uh, you know we are getting more and more mature, uh, in terms of uh, digital marketing and e-commerce, a lot of businesses are facing from Western and Central Europe, they're facing towards uh, the Balkans. They're looking at us as uh, a super interesting market. And not only Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, for example, which are part of the European Union, they're also looking into uh, countries from uh, Western Balkans, North Macedonia, Serbia, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, one day, in my opinion, this whole market will become uh, uh, one same playing field for uh, e-com businesses because uh, even right now we have some uh, we are seeing some platforms uh, working uh, to to be able to bring e-com businesses into the western balkans uh, you know making this uh, custom procedure easier and uh, you know also uh, the the logistics of uh, of goods easier to to those markets so what i can say now is that in my opinion the e-commerce here in our region will grow dramatically in the following years because a lot of businesses are are coming to to here and also we are uh, nations uh, good with computers good with uh, you know uh, communication so I, I see bright future ahead of us. I think that the pandemic of COVID-19 accelerated this process. Yeah, uh, it boosted it the process yeah. with at least five, six, even 
probably eight yeah. to ten years ahead. Do you see Balkans as uh, different markets? Uh, uh, for example, the Greek market, the Bulgarian market, the Romanian uh, market, or as a unit? Right now, there are some differences, and I see that people are dividing those markets. They are always saying, okay, Greek market, uh, maybe they are having this, this and that, Bulgarians are having this, this and that. But in my opinion, in the cup, in couple of years, uh, we will be more united. Uh, the communication, the logistics, and everything will go much easier. So we will be perceived as one united market where people will be, you know, will be able to 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 trade goods much easier. Uh, what do you think uh, that must uh, Balkans do to to be like the Western uh, European countries? Well, we are already like the Western countries. Uh, probably the, the, the only uh, thing that uh, we are different in is uh, we are kind of uh, price, our markets are price sensitive. It's uh, understandable because, uh, you know, uh, the salaries that uh, people here are receiving are not as big as in Western Europe. Uh, people have less money. Let's, let's put it on the table and be... Uh, be honest with this. Uh, so our markets are kind of uh, price sensitive. Uh, you can see people are going uh, to a price comparison sites so they can find the best price for each product. Sometimes the products uh, are, in, the difference in the price is only a few percentages, like two or three percent, but this is kind of significant for the buyer. So this is basically the main, the main difference. Yeah, there are some technicalities like uh, cash on delivery, for example, which uh, actually practically didn't exist in the Western world uh, in, in a few years. But we are also seeing some change in that direction as well, because uh, what we see right now is a lot of uh, Western countries like Germany, Austria, France, Spain, they are accepting now cash on delivery. And uh, there is an explanation be behind this. Sometimes uh, people uh, got tricked uh, online. They uh, receive uh, not exactly uh, the good that they ordered, or sometimes they purchase something and uh, it never appears and uh, the seller is not uh, uh, kind of nice enough to, to, to uh, provide the money back. So obviously they are adopting some of the the, the things that uh, we already already have because we don't trust uh, nobody here let's let's be honest we are Balkans uh, we are expecting to to be cheated all the time <laughs> and it's very difficult yeah. for an e-commerce company to be above the competitors because now e-commerce uh, market are the, like a red ocean yeah uh, so many uh, companies there so it's uh, very difficult to have uh, a growth in your company uh, what are the secrets to have uh, a growth in e-commerce company and be at the top of the list well if i know all the secrets <laughs> <laughs> and i share them with you you know there won't be a secret uh, yeah. there won't be secrets anymore but no uh, typically what we advise people when they come uh, and this is kind of different approach uh, depending on if this is a traditional business that wants to go online or somebody that wants to start from zero so let's uh, first uh, firstly look over uh, the the case when we have a traditional business willing to go online uh, we have many of this probably in Greece as well. Big companies on the market for, let's say, 20, 30 years. Great products, uh, great processes inside, but they don't have any, any kind of online presence. In that case, uh, what we advise usually is to, to start building, first of all, a team inside of the company that is taking care of all the digital presence, meaning digital uh presence in social media, digital communication, uh, developing uh, an e-commerce uh, store, also a team that uh, takes care of the, 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 the store itself because uh, having an e-com uh, shop store uh, is kind of a business inside of the business. It's a, it's a whole different uh, game. So this is what we advise uh, these big businesses when they want to, to get into the e-commerce field. Of course, uh, they need to have an advisor ab about this, like a consultant that can get them through the steps of, um, of the whole process. Uh, but this is mainly how it goes. Of course, they need money, but usually big businesses, they, they can uh, allocate some budget uh, for, for this uh, new venture. Well, for some 
some of them uh, it needs some time to to you know to establish this business and also get uh, to to be uh, recognized as an online player from now on because usually people are used to go to the physical stores and get their products uh, but this is let's say an easy transfer from the physical to the digital world if somebody wants to start from zero having no products having no brand or nothing uh, we advise completely different things like first of all uh, find uh, a good product which usually people are like okay maybe we can start with something cheap we, we sell it very fast okay this is not a good idea when you are selling something cheap uh, clients are usually not happy with it so you cannot really establish a good brand selling cheap products so what we advise in this situation is to make a good research find a very good product that is in help of your end customers and start building a brand around it. Because when you have a strong brand with quality products, you can uh, you know, live a longer time. And also building a brand allows you to then start diversifying into different categories. You can start with sports goods, let's say, but when you are well accepted brand and established brand and people trust you then you can switch to for example kid toys or i don't know any other category and we have a perfect example of this in bulgaria i have a friend of mine who established a, a business with sports goods he was on the top of the category for like 10 years uh, he decided to just uh, as a test open a category for kids products and now three years later his main business is kit products so he switched completely because he saw a huge a bigger potential in this new category so if i like start an e-shop from scratch and have a limited marketing budget uh, which actions do you think are the best to start building a brand is it uh, maybe ads social media seo where should the focus be when the budget is social media for sure <laughs> and I will support my answer with some numbers. A recent uh, research from one of our partners showed that uh, the traffic to the e-com shops in our region is coming from social media and the percentage is huge. 89% of the traffic is coming from social media. So obviously, when people are deciding where to shop from, their decisions are coming from social media. Their research is starting from social media. Their they might be seeing some advertisement on social media, or they might be seeing some uh, influencer showing up, showing off with a product. And this is where the journey starts. Then they go to uh, the, the, the e-com uh, shop to, to buy the product. But social media is the first step. Uh, what I will suggest right now is focusing on short videos. TikTok. Mm. I'm pretty sure that we will support this, <laughs> this opinion as well. Uh, because this is um, the media that works uh, the best right now. And uh, we're talking in 2024. It might be something different in a year. We, we cannot say it might be something different in just six months. We, we don't know. But right now, TikTok works great. Uh, we know that uh, in Greece, they already have ads. I, I, I'm right, right? I mean, yeah, I mean yes. they have yeah. ads because in Bulgaria, they still don't have the ads running. Yeah. Uh, they will open the ads somewhere around the end of 24. Uh, and of course, we know that there is uh, this uh, option now called TikTok shop. So people can buy directly from the app, which is which is fantastic, which is nice. This is, yes, from the perspective of an expert in the field of e-commerce, uh, many people will say, yeah, why are you advising that people should uh, get, have their TikTok shops? Isn't it better to have everything on my own uh, online store and, uh, you know, having this uh, uh, traffic coming to us so we can do whatever we want. We can, uh, you know, remarketing these people and so on and so on. Guys, you don't have let, a commission. Yeah, course. and not uh, to have commission. Yeah, let's be honest here. People are in social media and they're trying to uh, get out of uh, the online presence uh, with the product in their hands as quick as possible. So if we can have these products in their hands, our products in their hands in social media, let's do so. So do you think it's easy or difficult to build an international uh, e-commerce platform? In my opinion, it's kind of hard because right now there are so many strong international platforms and uh, to be able to reach a huge audience, 
uh, is kind of expensive. You know, let's let's be honest here. You cannot do it uh, overnight. You cannot do it with a limited budget. You cannot do it with just free videos uh, having uh, you know something interesting. Yeah, you might you might get to a bigger audience with one or two videos that uh, are going viral for a week or something like this. But this is most of the times uh, pure luck. So if you want to go international with your e-com business, in my opinion, the first step should be uh, going through some marketplace platforms, uh, touching a little bit each of the markets, checking uh, what, what's good for you on those markets, and then start establishing your own presence uh, on the particular market, and then start reaching local um, digital agencies that can help you with your digital presence and so on and so on. There are some some steps that you have to follow. I had in my mind uh, Temu saying uh, all these uh, big companies. And... Well, these big companies, first of all, we don't know where their budgets are coming from, <laughs> you <laughs> know, and, and how big they are. And uh, to be able to replicate their model, it's very hard for you know for a local player. It, in my opinion, they're they're different from for them. This is different story. I think China is like a special case yeah. in when it comes to e-commerce. Exactly, it's like a dark uh, field. We exactly. don't know much about it. Well, we see some local uh, players uh, coming from Turkey, coming uh, from uh, around the region, but they have huge investments behind their backs, uh, huge money in their pockets. So for them, it might be easy. But when we are speaking about a local player that wants to go internationally, uh, I always advise. Please make sure that you have a strong business in your home market so you're not replicating any problems on, on a, a new market. And then go market after market. Don't try to go like international to 10 markets uh, for three months. This is insane. This, is, uh, this needs insane budget. This needs uh, insane efforts. And it's not for everybody. You said before about social media and especially TikTok and short form videos. Are there any other trends in, in the e-com industry right now? Well... Besides social media and going internationally, I can see a huge trend in AI. Of course, mm -hmm. AI is everywhere. Uh, I have seen uh, some trends in using AI for uh, personalizing uh, uh, experience of the customer on your web shop. Uh, of course, AI is uh, used to uh, proceed huge amount of data and get results out of this data. So what I see is uh, uh, some uh, platforms that are helping you make your uh, listings better, going through different uh, listings of your own shop and also sh the shops of uh, your competitors and giving you the best result and uh, best uh, listing options for you to, to be better in front of your customers. I also see AI tools for email communication in terms of uh, uh, email to new clients, in terms of um, um, uh, transactional emails to existing clients, and also in terms of uh, uh, building uh, a loyalty program. So these solutions already exist and a lot of people are using them. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that there are many more. For example, I just uh, recently found uh, an AI tool that helps you in terms of customer support when you're talking on the phone. So what it does is it records, so you are basically recording all the calls, but this tool goes through all the recordings and uh, giving you results like, okay, in 45% of the calls, the customer support didn't help the customer in this particular way so maybe it's a good thing that you have you know this option for the customer and you are offering something in addition so this is uh, very useful for people that are running business uh, which uh, receives calls and uh, a lot of customer feedback what is your opinion on uh, on drop shipping i really don't like the word drop shipping <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a model look yeah. uh, to be honest this is a model and uh, even uh, in the past when we were running the business uh, with accessories for mobile devices our model was mixed we had some products in stock and we used some of uh, our partners to drop ship some most not most like it was 70 percent in stock and 30 percent drop shipping uh, why i don't like the term drop shipping is because people are using it as a 
completely different uh, uh, business model. Like uh, they're uh, uh, saying, okay, it's very easy. You just build a website, you order some goods in China, you send them all around. And you become rich. And you become rich uh, in, in a week. Uh, this is not the case. So uh, in my opinion, the, the right term for the drop shipping is uh, uh, three-way logistic. I mean, in which, of course, you have your website, you have built your brand, uh, you're ordering the goods, but once again, you have to be sure that those goods are uh, good quality, uh, you have a quality uh, provider of those goods that is uh, packaging well, putting on the all the infl inflates uh, inside the, the package. Uh, make sure that uh, you have a, a, a nice return policy, and if something happens, the the customer will be happy. So it's not just you know sending goods around and getting rich in a week. This is not uh, the, the case with dropshipping. How you rate an ESOP, and uh, which is the the most important thing? in ESOP to be successful? From the perspective of our contest, for example, we have seen that there are a few crucial things for each e-commerce shop. Maybe it's a good thing to share how we are evaluating those shops. Uh, we're evaluating them in terms of SEO, technical stuff mm -hmm. online, uh, design, marketing, uh, legal stuff, legal things like uh, uh, return policies, uh, GDPR, of course. Yeah, GDPR and everything, and also customer support. From all these six, uh, of course, they are all crucial, they are all important, but uh, we've seen that uh, uh, legal and customer support are most the most important because this is the, the point where you are touching directly with the client. What I mean is that everybody can build a website, Okay, not everybody, but there are many, many tools that can help you build a very nice looking website. Maybe there are tools that you can pay that will build your listings. They will be nice. They will be with the, the, the key phrases and keywords that you need for your SEO. Maybe I can hire a nice uh, digital agency that will produce my content and I will go viral. Everything, this is kind of, okay, not easy, but it's doable. But the next step is very important. What happens if the client buys and there is a problem? So here is, in my opinion, the most important thing. You have to be able to provide exclusively good customer support. Nice people answering on the phone. Nice people chatting in the chat platforms. Actually, one very important thing is that you have to be everywhere. Customers now are willing to communicate with you in Viber, WhatsApp. Facebook Messenger, wherever, you know, they're everywhere and they're expecting you to be everywhere. So also another tool that I discovered recently, uh, it's an AI tool that helps you being everywhere. It connects all of your channels into one single place of contact and you can communicate with your clients everywhere. So this is, in my opinion, the most crucial thing for every e-com business to be able to provide great, amazing customer support. One thing I don't like about many shops from my experience is that they try to avoid human contact as much as possible. And I understand it at some point because they have too many requests. So they make a lot of uh, frequently asked questions and they try to send you there to solve your problem. But they try to avoid speaking to, to a person as much as possible. And I think it's not the best, but how can an e-shop um, handle a very big amount of requests? Well, you are right. Uh, I've, I, I'm seeing it as well, not only in e-commerce, but any kind of industries, yes. they're trying to avoid the human contact. But in my opinion, it should be uh, vice versa. It should be a human contact because there is nothing better, in my opinion, for a person to feel uh, another person talking to on the other side mm -hmm. of the line and actually uh, at least showing a feeling and understanding of the problem because the machine or the chat platform doesn't show you understanding it shows you yes thank you and now do this now do this do that you, you know it's uh, probably with the ai we will be seeing some uh, better results in the future but uh, having the personal touch over everything is very crucial how they can handle it some sort of a customer support center where they train um uh, some uh, employees uh, to be better in answering uh, all the questions that people have, being in help. Of course, uh, this can be done uh, semi-automatic, semi-human uh, resource, uh, with human resources. Uh, when you see that there is a bigger problem, then the, the, um, the 
person can get in touch. Maybe some of the functions can be handled by uh, some sort of a chat platform or AI or something like this. But in, in my opinion, the, the, the hardest cases should be handled by, by people so the customer can see the, the human touch uh, over the problem. So AI and automations are game changing for this industry. Uh, what about metaverse? Well. I cannot uh, predict anything there yet. We see a lot of solutions uh, with uh, coming from uh, different uh, producers of these glasses and you know uh, gloves and all types of uh, stuff. In my opinion, we are still not there. Probably we will be there uh, in I don't know maybe. 10 years or something like this. Uh, why I'm saying 10 years? Because I'm seeing, I have two sons uh, of the age of nine and 14. The one who is 14 is mainly doing everything on his computer. Uh, when I go to his room, he already has two monitors and uh, <laughs> one of them is always in some sort of games like uh, Fortnite or uh, uh, Minecraft or something like this, which is basic the basic version of the metaverse they already live there so in my opinion when these kids which are now 13 14 to 16 uh become 23 24 25 this is probably when it will be their reality to put the glasses on and to be with their friends in the into the metaverse together and do some stuff together maybe this will be the point when they will uh be shopping online you know just going through into the uh, through the virtual Uh, store just picking products i go to many different conferences i see a lot of um, companies are providing solutions uh, where you can take a picture of a product and then you start uh, looking it uh, on your phone uh, in a 3d version or something like this uh, but i think we still need uh, like a decade or something to, to get to this point and it will come with the new generation. It's uh, it's not for us. I'm not seeing myself uh, buying uh, with glasses. I really want to go and touch the product and test it and uh, see how it, it looks in my hands. Maybe that's another thing that we have uh, here in Balkans that we want to see the products and feel them. So maybe this will help us a bit, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You said now that you are a father. Mm -hmm. You also have uh, many projects and companies that you are the head of uh, these projects. You travel a lot. You are going to uh, summits. Uh, and now you are here in uh, Athens. And you live in a city, uh, not the capital city of the Bulgaria, but a, a smaller city uh, nine, uh, next to the borders uh, with Romania. How do you can afford all these, uh, all these things in your day? It's easy. And this is actually one of the, for me, it's easy. You know, uh, probably this is what, what's the reason to for me to live in uh, the fifth largest city in Bulgaria called Turuse. It's on the border with Romania. Actually, for me, Bucharest uh, as a capital of Romania is closer than our own capital. Sofia is 300 kilometers from me and Bucharest is only 45 kilometers from Ruse. Probably this is the reason I'm living there because living in a smaller city where you have, by the way, everything that you need, you know, this is not like a city... Uh, that uh, nobody goes to it's it's still mm -hmm. a, a, a good uh, for living a city which is very good for living uh you know it gives me the time not to waste in traffic not to waste uh, you know my my day in activities different than being on the computer and being super productive uh, i have a full a working day from let's say eight to five if i want to have some meetings such a city is a lot easier to handle your kids I mean, raising your kids. Also, when I'm not at home, it's very easy for my wife to, to take care of them because usually what, what, uh, what is a, a funny story is that I have a friend in Sofia, Bulgaria, the capital city, who, uh, who drives one and a half hours in the morning to be able to bring his kids to school and then one and a half hours uh, in the traffic in the afternoon to pick them up from school and bring them to some sports. Those are three hours out of his life, which are lost forever. Yes, he's saying, yeah, I'm listening to some podcasts. I'm uh, listening to some audio books, but this is not a quality time. And then you go back home and you have to start your day and you are already tired of one and a half hours driving in traffic. For us in in city like Ruse, it takes only seven minutes. After seven minutes, you can be back in, on your computer and be super productive and super active. This is... This is uh, Probably why I choose to, to live in Ruse. Also, it's a very nice uh, way to raise your kids. Very calm city. Uh, no crimes. No uh, dangerous stuff going on. So 
this is how how I do it. This is practically my recipe. But you don't miss changes when you are not in the capital city. Uh, in the world we live today, I don't really see a difference. Yes, of course, I have to drive to Sofia from time to time. Every like two, three weeks, I have to go at least once because there are some partners that you have to see in person. Of course, in business, personal touch, like any other uh, field of communication, of course, but personal touch and having uh, a nice uh, lunch or coffee with a good partner, uh, you know, y- you cannot uh, just change it with a Zoom call over over the, the screen. Uh, but they can be reduced. Uh, they can be reduced, and also people are super busy. We we don't go to so many physical meetings uh, nowadays, and also with the, the 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 activities that we have when we bring people to some networking events in Sofia, it's very easy to to have all of our partners in one same place for a couple of hours, exchange all the ideas, everything that we have have to say to each other, and move on. Do you think you have accomplished the work life balance in your life? I think so, yeah, I think so. I'm happy the way I'm living my life. So if this is the, you know, the end goal, so to, for everybody to be happy in his life, I accomplished uh, this goal. I have a working business, which can be, uh, you know, uh, managed remotely. Um, I'm spending quality time with my family. Uh, just this weekend, I played some basketball with my sons, uh, had a nice walk with my wife. So. Yeah, I can I can say that uh, I accom- accomplished this goal. Which is your goals uh, or the end game for you? There is no end game and end goal for me. To be honest, I really like one book called uh, the the Endless Game of Simon Sinek, yeah. uh, which is uh, very nice. It explains the the idea of uh, uh, the difference between games that has end, like football game. It basically has some rules: twenty two players, one ball. Uh, whoever scores uh, more balls into the uh, to the other uh, team uh, uh, wins, and this is it, it. It ends in 90 minutes. For me, business life, there is no end. You know, uh, once we uh, finish the project uh, Balkan e-commerce summit this year, for example, which is our biggest project right now, uh, we will move on to the next Balkan e-commerce summit, or maybe building a bigger uh, project. I don't plan as a uh, you know, something that ends at some point and then what? I don't even see uh, life like it ends at some point. In my opinion, everything will continue forever. Do you think Bulgaria is a good country to do business in? Because here in Greece, many people go there to do business and establish a business. In the recent years, uh, Bulgaria made some changes that uh, made the business atmosphere very, uh, you know, uh, welcoming for a lot of uh, companies, even from abroad. Yes, in my opinion, it's very easy. We have low taxes. We have uh, quality workforce. Uh, we have, uh, you know, if you want to establish an office, for example, in Sofia or, or any other cities, the rent is not... Uh, very high, so you can you can do it. So yeah, in my opinion, the, the 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 easiest question is yes, Bulgaria is a very nice place to do business, and it's in the heart of the Balkans. So if you want to be equally connected to, let's say, Turkey, Greece, uh, North Macedonia, Serbia, all the Western Balkans, Romania, Hungary, in my opinion, Bulgaria is the right place to be. Yes, of course, Bulgaria is in the center of Balkans. But do you see that uh, the Balkan e-commerce summit uh, will be hosted here in Athens, uh, for example, or in other city? We have this idea to bring Balkan e-commerce summit in different uh, countries and different cities from 2025. Of course, after the execution of uh, the, the edition in 2024, we have to sit and we have to observe all the all the options. We have to make a great research of venues. Uh, agencies and people that can help us uh, in terms of uh, preparation, in terms of execution, in terms of uh, communication and many other things. And yeah, we can get this decision. Athens is one of uh, the places where we are seeing it uh, to be to be possible to be done. So uh, only the time we will answer this question. <laughs> uh, so wh- for what reason some uh, Greek will come to e-co- Balkan e-commerce summit in Sofia? This is 
for me, very easy question to answer. Mm -hmm. And it's not applying only for the Greek companies and Greek uh, entrepreneurs and digital marketing people and digital people in general. This applies to everybody, everybody from the region. First of all, it will provide everybody with great connections. We are bringing right now companies uh, in our expo, but not only in the expo, from 17, more than 17 countries. We, we focused on the, the Balkan uh, region, but we already have partners from Austria, from Germany, from, from United Kingdom, Kingdom, from Spain. This is insane. This is becoming super popular. And probably the reason is the one that I told you earlier. Mm -hmm. We are becoming very interesting market for the Western uh, Europe. Uh, second reason, people that visit Balkan e-commerce summit will be able to establish uh, connections not only with companies that are providing different services, but companies that are like them, companies that are doing pretty much the same in a uh, in a different market. They can get together, they can uh, share ideas, they can share uh, knowledge, experience, and maybe they can do some business together. Another reason is uh, the 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 nice um, uh, speakers that we already uh, managed to bring to the event. We have speakers from Meta, from TikTok, from uh, Microsoft, from Geopost, from uh, one of the largest price comparison platforms in all Central Europe operating on nine markets. Uh, we are expecting uh, a final answer from Kaufland e-commerce, which is uh, a big platform in Western Europe. Everybody from our region that wants to sell in Western Europe can use. We're expecting uh, an answer from one of the largest Turkish marketplace platforms, which are very interested to visit uh, the event. So this is, in my opinion, the right place to be if you want to grow your e-com business in the next years. Uh, what is your UPS uh, from this event? What is different or unique uh, uh, in comparison to other? It, it brings all the major and important players on the market together, but not only from, uh, uh, from the Bulgarian, Romanian or Greek markets, but from all of these markets together in one place. So if you are an e-commerce or digital marketing expert or doing some business in that field, you have to be there so you get to know each of uh, if, each of these guys and become partners with them. You have experience uh, to organize this type of events. You are also a curator of uh, TEDx uh, Russe. Uh, what do you think about uh, the TEDx uh, as a, an event? TEDx as a format is a, a bit different oh. thing, a, bit, a lot different than what we are doing in our conferences. TEDx is a very nice event that brings... Uh, uh, it has a different branding, you know, it uh, brings a lot of interesting people together. Of course, it, it focuses on uh, different uh, topics in general. Uh, what uh, you usually have to do when you are applying for a license from TEDx, you have to uh, give them the topics that you want to focus. TEDx uh, as an event, as an organize, uh, organization, uh, as you may know, uh, it's a non-profit thing. When you are doing it, you don't have to make profit out of it. It's uh, basically done from the community, for, from the community to the community. The idea is that people with uh, time and energy do something for their communities. So this is uh, why I applied for this license. Um, uh, we took uh, this event and we started it in 2020. Actually, this was a very hard time for us to execute the very first edition because it was during COVID. We needed to postpone uh, several times because we couldn't gather the people inside of a room because of the, the rules uh, in the country. Uh, but TEDx is a very nice event and uh, I uh, strongly encourage everybody that uh, wants to do something from for his community to apply for a license to make uh, a TEDx in their own communities because it's not only for cities you can apply for university or even if you have some small community of like 50 60 people you can apply for such uh, such event and you can execute it so tedx uh, is non-profit uh, event if you want to build a profitable event in which revenues you must focus on I won't be able to answer about all the categories and all the fields of events that there exist because uh, wh where we are focused is e-commerce. And uh, for me, it's kind of unique combination between having knowledge on e in e-commerce, uh, 
be very well connected in the field of e-commerce with all the service providers and all the digital experts that I know because of my experience and also having the knowledge how to organize a great event. So maybe if somebody wants to be profitable in doing an event, should be able to have uh, such a combination of uh, knowledge and social network uh, for uh, a field that he is an expert in. So maybe this is this is my recipe. I don't know if everybody will be able to apply it, but uh, if uh, if such a person you know wants to to be profitable in terms of events, I mean this might be the the solution for him. If you uh, didn't make an e-commerce event, uh, in which area do you want to make an event, like startup event or business event? Something? Well, this is a very nice question, and I have never thought about building events outside uh, the e-commerce area. But if I have to answer it, I will say one thing. Probably events about people being outside uh, the digital world. Because I I see this as a problem in the community. Uh, people are too obsessed with their phones, tablets, laptops, and they are living in the digital world. We already mentioned metaverse. Probably, as we said, it will happen in several decades. They will be living in the metaverse. But in my opinion, they should be having uh, breaks from time to time, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe something like this. So if I have to do something besides e-commerce, it should be uh, you know, some sort of a retreat that goes for a week or two weeks where people do things outside the digital world. So I'm seeing it as a place where they leave their phones, tablets, computers, somewhere locked in their cars or whatever, somewhere locked, they don't have access to them and they do things that don't connect with the, with the internet at all. And of course, they, they wouldn't uh, shop online from a commerce platform. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah <laughs> for <side>. sure. <laughs> no, for, to be honest, uh, I don't remember if, if it was in 2020 or 2021, but I decided to try to get like a digital detox for a month. I throw my uh, phone, laptop and everything. Yes, to be honest, I was checking my email every second day just to see if something urgent appears. Mm -hmm. But I was not replying on uh, social media. I was not uh, replying on messaging platforms anywhere. Uh, 30 days, to be honest, I felt refreshed after these 30 days. I had the time to read a lot of books. I had the time to reconnect with some friends. I had the time to spend quality uh, hours with my my family because even if you are with your family from time to time you are looking at this device and let's see if maybe somebody wrote something super interesting well for 30 days i didn't lost much i didn't uh, lost any contacts i didn't lost track of the time or the events it was quite the same but i felt refreshed that's great but it also sounds difficult <laughs> especially if your job has to do with social media so it's almost impossible well <laughs> maybe you can you can plan it in advance and you can uh, hand over all the things that you have to do in social media to somebody and then just go to your vacation <laughs> digital vacation <laughs> maybe we should try it uh, one day <laughs> yeah it's difficult but uh, it's nice try it yeah, I remember after I came back from my digital detox, uh, a media in Bulgaria called me and they said, look, we, we have to make an interview with you. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't do something uh, so special. I didn't go to Everest. It was just uh, 30 days without my phone. What What's the occasion? No, 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 we have to do it because we have to understand. And they're digital media only, you know, they don't have like, <laughs> so yeah, uh, it was nice. Yeah. It, it, I received a lot of uh, feedback. People were asking me how it was, uh, should I do it? And yeah, if somebody has the opportunity to do it only for a week or something, they should give it a try. Nice. So uh, we're going to the final question. It's a question that we always uh, made to all our, uh, our guests. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is your biggest advice uh, or an advice that uh, you would give to your younger self? Probably never stops and when you are passionate about something just keep doing it even if you have hard times if you have even if you have fails even if you have troubles if you even if you uh, have lack of money or wasting money and you don't see it uh, you know as a clear result at the end if you are passionate about something if you like it from your soul just keep doing it because at some point it will start rewarding you 
in probably during the way it will start rewarding you in different ways and at some point it will become profitable and it will make you a better person. Very nice advice. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me with you. Thank you. So this was an episode. Uh, Nikola Ilchev was incredible. So if you want to listen entire conversation below in the description, we have all the links for Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, and uh, our site business review uh, businessrev.gr all in the description of the YouTube video. So if you like this video, don't forget to make a like and make a subscribe if you want to see more videos like this in the future. And of course, uh, we want to comment something or to ask something uh, to Nicola. Uh, and of course, uh, till the next episode, I wish you are uh, all well and follow your dreams.